I talked to you in the past in this forum about uh, my tissue research, uh, about various surgical procedures, how to make a thumb, how to make someone smile. Talked about the administration, but I want to tell you about one of the passions that's been part of my career for a long time. And that's uh, volunteering and uh, going overseas and uh, working in the developing world. Um, this is what I'll talk about. We'll talk about the current need, uh, the global need for surgery, something that uh, Sherry Wren and Tom Weiser talk a lot about. What is global reconstructive surgery? This is a term we coined um, and how that's coming into play. I'll talk about the history of Stanford. There's a long legacy by my predecessors of volunteerism in plastic surgery, as well as the organization Resurge International, which shows how a nonprofit can work very well with an academic institution, and then some future digital steps that one of our uh, residents, Peter Deptula, is working on. First, the current global need for surgery. Uh, this is a very important uh, document that came out in 2015. The Lancet Commission uh, was convened on global surgery and found that five billion people have no access to surgical care. That means, you know, for Dr. Longacre, if he plays basketball on the weekend and has an ACL tear, I bet you Monday morning he's on the operating room table. And that's kind of expectation for all of us. Whereas if someone has a severe burn in sub-Saharan Africa, that wound stays as an open wound for months and months until it weeps off and the scar contracts, and we'll show you examples of that. It's changing. Before, the WHO would only talk about malaria, HIV, major diseases, but now uh, emergency and essential surgical care is coming on the forefront, much to the efforts of people in this room in general surgery. But when I uh, try to raise money for overseas surgery, this is the dilemma that I have to tell donors. Um, you know, how can we justify doing one cleft lip or one burn reconstruction when that same amount of money can be used for to vaccinate 100 children? So that's the debate that's out there. But when we delve deeper and show them the financial impact of reconstructive surgery, on the left there is a child with a severe burn. This is what happens when that raw wound heals over time. The joints will fuse in this way. So he can't use his elbow, his shoulder, his hand, his fingers. He can't go to school. He can't work. Probably a caretaker, a mother or a father, has to stay home with them. So the economic impact of releasing this at age eight and streamed out the rest of his life as well as his caretaker's life is a good, pretty good deal. <clears throat> with about $250 and uh, uh, an hour of surgery, we can release this scarred, burn hand. And you can see the contracture starts at the mid forearm, but once you release the scar and push it back, you see the original burn wound, and on the right is a simple skin graft that's put on here. We did this in Cambodia in about 45 minutes. Uh, here is a case of a cleft hand. Uh, we did this in about two hours in Cambodia, moving the index finger back into its normal position, away from the thumb. With a little bit amount of work, you have a benefit of a lifetime of assimilation and function. You'll see some staggering statistics on the right, but the biggest, I think, is in the middle, where it's the poorest third of the world, two and a half billion people, poorest third of the world, receive only 3.5% of all the surgeries that are available. And if you look at uh, burns, which is a big area that we work on, uh, you have 11 million burn injuries per year and 200,000 deaths. What does that leave? That leaves about 10 million, over 10 million people who need reconstruction from the burns that they suffer. And a vast majority of these are women and children in the developing world. I always tell donors that the open cooking flame and that beautiful sari that, that's worn in India is a terrible combination. It's flammable and it results in very fast burns. In terms of congenital uh, abnormalities, uh, five, in ten, five in 100 children in Vietnam are born with an abnormality. Road traffic accidents, those of you who've traveled in, bank, in, uh, in Thailand or in Cambodia or in Laos, you know how many scooters are out there, how many people you fit on the scooter around a roundabout. What you don't see usually are the accidents that happen and the distal third fractures and the need for microsurgery to the lower extremity. So that's the global need for surgery. Let's talk about what we have coined uh, global reconstructive surgery. Uh, we just uh, published this textbook last week. It is available on Amazon if you're interested. Uh, but the idea is what is global reconstructive surgery? And the idea is that we want to address reconstructive needs throughout the world. What is appropriate in that world? So clefts, burns, trauma, hand, microsurgery. And, what are, and reconstructive surgery throughout the body. So I'll show you examples from head to toe. And really, 
what is appropriate in the local environment as opposed to what we can do here with the best equipment possible, but what techniques are applicable overseas that we can teach and can be utilized all the time when we're not there. And so those are the tips that we're trying to get, and that's what that textbook tries to get at, is using the tried and true methods that will give you a great result, not shortchanging these developing countries, but giving the, sh the, the best tried and true result that can be done at the cheapest price. And so what we do is we deliver and teach all of reconstructive surgery. Some organizations have chosen a different model, Operation Smile and Smile Train. They're great organizations. You'll see them in the New York Times ads, but they have concentrated on cleft lip and palate. Why? It's a great business model. Cleft lip pre and post-op cases are amazing to see. They, they pull you in emotionally. Also, those cases can be done safely in about an hour and a half. So as a unit principle of making a product, it's a really defined product. And so organizations have chosen to focus on those because it's fast group, we can do a lot of cases, you can show your donors great results and you've done a lot of those cases. That's completely understandable. But what's been left behind are the majority of the reconstructive problems that all of us face in plastic surgery. Not only the cleft lip on the upper left, but this severe burn contracture. This is the typical case we'll see overseas where just that raw wound will begin to creep in. General surgeons know an open appy wound, how that amazingly creeps in over time with wet to dry dressings. Well, with enough dressing changes, it will heal in, but it'll deform the joints in this way. The beautiful thing about this is we know where to release the skin and everything beautifully unfurls back into its normal position. That's a burn contracture. In the middle is a child with ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S, ptosis which is an abnormality of being unable to raise the eyelids. So this child has a mother with ptosis and has a grandmother with ptosis. We saw her in Cambodia. And those three, that whole family would walk around like this just to be able to see because they can't raise their eyelids. With another hour and a half of surgery, we can recreate that function. The girl on the right is another girl in Cambodia who stepped on a landmine. And we have to do microsurgery to reconstruct the legs, otherwise she's gonna be a bilateral amputee at age four. So we try to do all of reconstructions. It's not as tightly knit and, com and confined as a cleft lip and palate, and that's why we think our organization, our faculty, try to cover everything else and to teach it for further generations, future generations. So who needs reconstructive surgery? We always say the unlucky. Uh, either they're born with a problem, no fault of their own, Either they have come down with cancer, no fault of their own, or they suffer burns and accidents. So truly the unlucky, and they're usually very healthy patients, and that's why we can operate overseas in more austere environments and return them to a life uh, that is uh, very productive. Plastic surgery really is all over the body. It's from the uh, scalp to the toes. Dr. Longinger talk, likes to talk about skin and its contents. It's really a we see, we see everything as part of our domain, from the skin to the bone to the muscle to the nerve. We're, we're orthopedic surgeons, we're, we're vascular surgeons, we're neurosurgeons. Uh, we do all of these things related to the, the reconstruction we do. So I'm gonna take you through from top to bottom some of the things we do in reconstructive surgery, and I want you to think of these in the context of what is necessary overseas and how we can teach these overseas. So the first is a, a great example, is a cleft lip and palate. You can see the incredible uh, result that uh, Dr. Lorenz has, uh, has achieved. A very wide cleft lip on the, on the uh, and palate on the left, and then the beautiful result on the right. But this is such a wide one that it's very hard to do in one stage. So Dr. Lorenz has to meticulously tape the upper lip and allow the tissue to, to mold in a, a way before doing this. Most programs, when they do it overseas on one of these mission trips that you fly in and do, they don't have the luxury of doing that, so they kind of bring it together in a very tight way. But what I'm trying to argue in the next generation is we have to teach those taping methods that Dr. Lorenz does so that we have a more sustainable way of giving the best result possible. We always feel that in the developing world, the results should be just as good as they're done here with Dr. Lorenz. One of my residents uh, went to Vietnam and worked on this ptosis case. This is a unilateral ptosis. I told you what ptosis is already. Can't raise the, the, uh, the eyelid. And you can see on the right there, it's cranial nerve three. On the right there, she has unilateral ptosis. And again, with an hour of work, this child can see without any visual obstruction. It can be something simple like a leg wound 
something like this, but a skin graft may not work on this because of the joint that's exposed. And what we try to do is try to teach different flaps that can be used. This is a multiple test question we use for our residents. Which one do you use? Basically, it's a rhomboid flap that you can lift up the skin, take advantage of the laxity of the tissue. I tell our residents, we're tailors. We need to know when the tissue is loose, what we can use to reconstruct it. And we can choose number one and bring that in with 45 minutes of work. If you teach someone overseas how to do this, they will have this the rest of their career. A total nasal reconstruction. We see this from accidents and um, crimes overseas in different parts of the world. And this woman has uh, basal cell cancer and lost most of the tip of her nose. This is a, a interesting, uh, intellectual problem for reconstructive surgeons because you can't simply just put a piece of tissue on it. You have to really design the three-dimensional structure. You're an architect at this point. And so what we have to do is we have to need some structural support. So we'll take cartilage from behind the ear, rob different parts of the body that we can take tissue from. So we, we know where all the spare parts are. When I look at Dr. Longacre and he's talking to me, he's, he thinks I'm listening to him, but I'm really looking at all the spare parts he may have <laughs> that I can use in any future reconstruction. So I can take that cartilage from behind the ear and I can take the skin from the forehead here, the forehead flap, and turn it, lift it up and turn it 180 degrees and use it to cover the nose. And then we'll have this right after the operation, but what you'll notice is that there's still a bridge across from the top. That's where the blood supply comes from. Plastic surgery is all about blood supply, what we can take, what we can use, to, at least temporarily. So that blood supply continues to be up here. And that's that artery feeds this whole thing. But after three weeks, miraculously, we can disconnect it, shape it, and put it back into position. And she can have a result like this three or four weeks after surgery. Again, how can we fly in from overseas and do these stages well? We can't. We need to teach our colleagues overseas how to do these well. This is a burn scar contracture, another girl in Cambodia. We saw maybe 100 uh, patients, about 30 of them had severe burns. This is a severe burn that's healed over time. You can imagine the pain, the anguish, the months that this child went through to reach a result like this, just to have the tissue, one end of the normal tissue touched the other end of the normal tissue to seal the wound. And so everything's scarred in, and this is the type of release we need to do and how we have to reconstruct it. This child will probably need two or three more releases and skin grafting. Again, that's why we get to sustainable programs that we interact with. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart. This is a policization, which means that little nubbin of a thumb isn't going to do anything. It's ornamental only. And so we have to find a way to remove that and to uh, use some other digit, in this case the index finger, so we design uh, inc incisions like this, and then we can dissect that. We need to know which arteries and veins we have to save, otherwise the digit will die. We need to know the blood supply. We need to follow the nerves out. If we just came across the nerves, it would be an insensate new thumb. And so we bring this out. We bring the tendons. And you can see if we freed up the tissue and released the bone, I've already talked about working on the blood vessels, the bone, the tendon, and the nerve. And we'll move it over into this position here to make a new thumb. And you actually don't really notice that the patient is missing one finger because as you look at our fingers in space, we don't really look at each other like this. But as long as the gap is not there, and as long as the thumb is there, we can fool the rest of the world that that, that digit is still there. Here's the child right afterwards. So this is a classic operation that we teach overseas. I did, I did a trip in Vietnam where I spent two weeks teaching policization. Why? because we were in close contact with that hospital. They didn't know how to do this. They lined up about 10 cases of pulsation. We did those over two weeks. And from then on, they just kept sending me pictures of what, what they've done because they're phenomenal surgeons. That's the goal, not to just do it one time, but really to, to, um, to teach and to uh, give them that procedure forever. Now, microsurgery, as our faculty here knows, in Department of Surgery is something we do a lot of here at Stanford. Um, this requires a microscope usually and very small sutures, 9-0 and 11-0 suture, but allows freedom to reconstruct. The other cases I've shown you before, the tissue is usually adjacent to the defect. So we were able to move things in. We moved the index finger to make a new thumb um, because the blood supply is not disconnected. Or we take a very thin piece of skin graft and put it on. But in this case, 
we need to have freedom to operate, freedom to remove a piece of tissue and move it somewhere else. This is usually a one-year fellowship after we finish reconstructive and plastic surgery. And really, it's using fine uh, microsurgical technique. This is about a one and a half millimeter uh, vessel that we have to put eight stitches in uh, circumferentially and prevent it from leaking. And we use microsurgery, again, freedom to operate. We can use it to um, repair a small blood vessel. This is an aneurysm in, I think, a three-year-old child at the brachial artery that we can uh, repair with a vein graft. We can use it to fill a hole. This is an orthopedic problem where on the left, that's a large defect. That's a metal rod you're seeing in a tibia, and it's a large tibial defect. This is a classic problem that we see overseas in, in Vietnam and other places where there's a lot of road traffic accidents. So we have to bring in tissue. The, the leg is so skinny that you don't have tissue there. You have to move tissue from somewhere else. So that's actually thigh tissue that we've transplanted to the leg. We have, we're transplant surgeons, but I always tell Mark Melcher the benefit is we don't have to worry about all that immunosuppression stuff afterwards. We can take the leg bone. Here's the, if you see the cheekbone there and the plates, that's a fibula. That's one of the leg bones, the fibula that we can transplant to make a new maxilla. And uh, the uh, perineal uh, artery is reconnected to the uh, carotid artery in an endocide fashion. So we move tissue into the head and neck area. We can use microsurgery to make uh, breasts. This is a woman with bilateral uh, uh, mastectomies after cancer who has immediate reconstruction. Um, and you can see the type of result you can get from taking the abdominal tissue and transplanting it into the um, breast. If you go to our main ORs here, this is happening every day with a collaboration between general surgery and plastic surgery. And we can use it to put something back on. Here is uh, a hand that's been amputated. And if you get it within a good amount of time with a few hours of work on a Sunday afternoon, you can put the hand back on and recreate the function for this gentleman going forward. And you can use microsurgery to recreate a smile. And I've, show, I've given you lectures before on this, how we can transplant a thigh muscle to recreate a smile on her face that works. That when one side smiles, the, the nerve will rush across to the other side, the impulse, and cause the other side to smile simultaneously. So I've given you an idea of the cases, but really the mantra here is that global reconstructive surgery, that term, global throughout the world, throughout the body, needs to be tailored to local needs and local hospital resources. We can't just keep dropping in and flying in and doing this and leaving, leaving a mess many times. In that context, I'll talk to you about the history about Stanford, how Stanford's been involved in this for the last 50 years, and about Research International and the marriage between a nonprofit and an academic institution. So, uh, research was started in 1969 uh, by my predecessor, Dr. Don Laub, who was then chief of plastic surgery at Stanford, really a remarkable human being. Uh, this boy, Antonio, was found in Mexico with an unrepaired cleft lip as a teenager. Imagine going to school with that. And uh, so Dr. Loud, who was good heart, flew him up to Stanford, Professor Chase, uh, our, our original uh, uh, chief of plastic surgery, was also chair of surgery in this institution, uh, did the cleft uh, lip and palate repair. And he returned back to uh, Mexico, integrated into society, and, and stayed a friend of Interplast for a long time, but that was the initial case. So this is before Operation Smile, before all the things that we do. This, there was never any kind of thought of this uh, idea. And so Stanford and Research have been involved for the last 50 years. It started as an organization called Interplast that you may have heard of. It was Interplast, and then in the 90s, they changed the name to Research and some corporate branding. Uh, but it was originally Interplast, and uh, Dr. Don Laub started it. In about 1999, 30 years later, the realization came aboard that um, if you really want to be effective, you got to get the best people that you've trained continuing to do that in the local environment all the time. And you got to pay people to do that, okay? The common misconception is people say, a lot of the people on our board who aren't doctors say, okay, well, you've trained these great doctors. How come they're not continuing to do this? Well, you know, these doctors in their home country have lives too. They want to eat well. They want to send their kids to college, et cetera, et cetera. So we continue paying them to do that. So some, some of the doctors have a private practice, and then we pay them to do certain cases. We're like insurance companies. Others are true saints, and their entire lives are, are built on, on uh, re getting reimbursed to do these cases for the poor. And so in 1999, uh, the majority of the cases through Resurge now have been done by our great partners overseas 
who frankly know a lot more about how to do these cases well uh, than we do, because we may not see these same issues. And so research is kind of like an insurance company. I'll actually see the cases, they'll send me pre-operative pictures and then their post-operative result. And I'm like an insurance company person, I actually stamp it and say this, this is very good surgery and um, we'll reimburse you for this. Donors from the Bay Area pay so that we can uh, uh, reimburse them. Or I'll say, you know, this isn't an appropriate case. Um, this, this isn't necessary, or you kind of, you've unbundled, you're trying to charge too much for these cases. So I'm just as tough as an insurance company to make sure our donor money is, is well spent. And we also teach, we say, well, next time you may just use a skin graft instead of doing this elaborate flap. So there's a kind of a crosstalk back and forth. In 2013, they reached a milestone of 100,000 surgeries, and I joined in 2014 as a way of getting our plastic surgery residents back involved. As many organizations go, in the 80s, there was a schism between research and Stanford, our Stanford Plastic Surgery Division. Why? Egos as usual, right? So at that point, Stanford residents never got involved with uh, research. And we really lost something in our training program at that time because we lost that kind of initial early experience with volunteerism and globalism. And so one of the reasons I kind of joined as the consultant for uh, research is to kind of bring the, our faculty and bring our residents uh, back aboard. And now you can ask, the, it's really an integral part of our program. They're really so involved. They, they know our colleagues overseas and we keep going over and over. So it's been a really uh, a wonderful collaboration. This is research's uh, scope of reconstructive surgery. Really, like I said, not just cleft lip, but we deliver and teach all of reconstructive surgery, including missing ears, uh, here is what the organization, again, this is a nonprofit. This is what the organization looks like. About six million in uh, revenue and about six million in expense. So this is the amazing thing. There's no, when I went there, I didn't realize it, but there's no huge endowment. It's not a big organization like the Whitaker Foundation or Johnson and Johnson. It's not a big endowment. But basically, those people in research, those professionals who work in this nonprofit, they're not doctors, they chose them as their career. To, to make this possible for us to do this overseas. So they actually uh, have to raise money from scratch every year. So they have lots of um, <clears throat> commitments to people overseas who have careers based on what research pays them. So every year in September, they have to raise $6 million because they know they spend $6 million. And they do this every year, it's, it's quite incredible. You can see that 60% of people are individuals who donate. We have people who donate $25,000 or more. Our venture capital friends here will uh, donate that much money to, because the, the message is so pure. It's a good thing for people to donate to because they see the long-term effect of the teaching, but they also have the immediate effect of seeing a child that has an operation. Uh, so they can't see where the money goes to. And two million of, of the money is really volunteer services. When we send Dr. Curtin or Dr. Lorenz or Dr. Sen overseas to operate and teach, they're not getting paid for it. They get an economy class ticket to go and uh, middle seat back, usually, um, and um, they, they go. They're happy to give their one or two weeks of vacation time to go. So there's still about eight uh, two week trips where we go to places like Tanzania, uh, way out where there are really no doctors to train. We do that in certain areas. Um, again, most of the money is spent on outreach partners, local doctors who we've certified and we've vetted who do this. Um, and here are some of those success stories. Uh, Dr. Shankar Rai was a general surgeon and, went and was in Kathmandu and he saw one of those team trips. Some Americans jetted in through Resurge Interplast and he said, Kat, I want to be like these guys. So Resurge invested in him, trained him, and now he runs the biggest hospital and program in Nepal with, with nine uh, plastic surgeons on staff there. Uh, Jorge Palacios, another great guy, a friend of Dr. Laub's, uh, who basically started his own research in his home country of Ecuador and has trained uh, many plastic surgeons to continue his work. And so these are really saints in their country. Uh, Dr. Shafqa Kundakar, who directs a program in Bangladesh, and he's one of our biggest outreach programs. So there's no way we can replicate what they do every day of their lives with our, with our trips. And so what I've tried to do since 2014 is the first three we've done already. We've, have, uh, su we've supported outreach partners. My charge was to train the next generation of reconstructive surgeons in many countries, really to, to do my day job 
for this nonprofit. And so we came up with the Research Global Training Program, and uh, we tried to get, build capacity. I told you how there's five billion people without access to surgery. That means every year there's 143 uh, million plastic surgery reconstructive needs cases annually that are not being met, okay? So we can't have Shakwa, Shankar, and Jorge do all those cases. We really need to tra train a whole cadre of people who uh, can do this. And so this is what we've tried to do. I'll take you through each of these steps in my punch list, uh, starting from engaging faculty around the world to funding the trained surgeons who continue operating. That's my end goal, is to fund many more of these surgeons who continue operating. And so I went through my Rolodex and called upon all of my colleagues from the American Board of Plastic Surgery, uh, various uh, organizations, and you know what? All of these famous professors at different academic institutions signed on. Why? Because that's probably why most of us went into plastic surgery in the first place, kind of the idea of being able to do this overseas. It's a big part of our lives. And a lot of people said, yeah, I've been putting this off because I've been working my lab and, and doing all the stuff. I'm program director here, but uh, it's time is right. I really want to do this. And really, they're doing it in an academic way. We send them to, to teach and not just to work for two weeks. And the next step was to develop a curriculum. So all of those academic faculty have put together a curriculum of over 150 slide talks that are um, geared in a 20 minute length of time in a very simplified way uh, that's easily translatable uh, in terms of language and in terms of procedure and in terms of supplies overseas. And these are open source and available to everyone. Not only that, is that um, they've all been converted to video. These are 20 minute talks uh, that are, are videoed uh, someone reading through those, and uh, it's amazing. You guys know Danielle Rockland, one of our uh, surgery residents. Uh, she hid up in the office here in the Department of Anatomy and uh, narrated all of them, including stopping at various times to describe the wound, to ask questions. So it's an interactive video that we can use in various forums. And so she does all this. And I told her she's going to be the voice of global reconstructive surgery forever. Next, we have to identify host programs. A lot of programs are interested, but some just don't have the capacity or the resources or the deep interest to be involved intimately for many years. We need a hero who knows the local politics at the home institution. She or he has to be able to garner the resources to get operating room time when we come, to get support to get supplies, to get the therapists and anesthesiologists to get involved so that when we come to teach, there's substrate, there's material, there's patients and staff to teach. And so we spend a lot of time trying to engage those people at various countries. We don't just call up someplace and go in, but we really have to build up over time. And for years and years, we, you kind of know who's good to work with and who's not, who answers your email in one day versus who doesn't email you two weeks later, right? So that's how we kind of screen people and we kind of come up with these different programs in these different countries. We also have pet projects. We have a major donor, a major vintner who loves Bhutan. And so we found that we can establish a, a, a program in Bhutan and make sure that's funded for a long time. There has to be a need, there has to be a hero, and there has to be funding for us to make this work. I'll give you an example of how this happens. Uh, I'll give you an example of a visiting educator trip. So ideally, we go to each site four times a year. So because if you do it once every two years or, or once a year even, it's kind of a cool thing. You have some visitor come in, but you really don't get a sense of the continuity. But I feel if we go four times a year, then you know it's always on the uh, schedule. It's like M&M, &M. it's always on the schedule. You know it's coming around again. So then you can actually save some difficult operations for the next team coming in. And also, you don't feel bad if a child has a cold or something and can't be done because you go, don't worry, we'll be back in three or four months and we'll do this again. So that's the goal and that's why I'm trying to have enough money um, and support to get this. But then we send our best professors from the US over there. Dr. Longyearn knows Charlie Thorne, very famous Park Avenue plastic surgeon, also an expert in microtia, the ability to make a new ear from rib graft. Uh, so you take ribs and then you carve it and you make a new ear. So only a few people in the world know how to do this very well. Dr. Thorne happens to be one of them. He's also the chair of the American Board of Plastic Surgery. And here's a guy who's probably 58 or so, Park Avenue office. He's got it all dialed in, blue blazer, Yale club, 
you know, goes on east side, up and down Lexington Avenue. That's all he does, right? Very busy practice. However, I found out that he was a Peace Corps volunteer right after Yale. And he lived in Africa for two years. So at one of these uh, board cocktail parties, I brought a martini over to him. And I said, hey, Charlie, when you were 24, after the Peace Corps, if someone told you that you could, um, that they would pay you to fly over to Vietnam and dodge the, the motorcycles with a backpack and teach what you love to do, wouldn't you go for it? You'd be paid. And he goes, oh, hell yeah, I'd do that. I go, well, Charlie, today's your day, because <laughs> I'm doing that for you. And he goes, damn it, okay, fine. So then he flew, economy class, middle seat, back, and uh, I think it was the only time Charlie flew economy class. He doesn't even fly economy here in the States. He flew economy, took a resident with him, loved the interaction. He did two index cases. We lined up two perfect cases for him, the supplies. Here's his ear carving on the left. That's two or three ribs, our fashion, a three-dimensional framework, and how he puts it in there on that case. And then the second case, they actually lift it off the back of it. That's an ear reconstruction. But the most important thing is not just taking care of one kid in Vietnam, but all of the cases that are done. These are students and residents who are learning how to trace an ear, how to use the contralateral side. You take x-ray film, you trace the normal ear, and you turn it to the other side because it's clear. You can just flip it and design the tracing on the opposite side and how they can carve it out of cheap materials as practice to do this. The most gratifying thing that Charlie Thorne said is that two weeks later, he started getting pictures back of the cases that their head surgeon had done very carefully with the team. And that's the wonder of teaching as opposed to just doing one case. And so we've um, had all of these other household names in plastic and reconstructive surgery go on different specific trips, burn reconstruction in the country, a facial fracture, a microsurgery in Havana, a craniofacial surgery in Hanoi, really specific things because that's the level some of these programs have gotten to. They want to do the, real, the hard stuff. The other thing is, when we used to go to these countries and lecture to an audience like this, we didn't really know who was a doctor, who was a resident, who was a nurse, who was filler. You know, some place they actually bring in the secretaries and everyone to fill in the audience so you don't feel bad. And so we never knew them. We never knew what was going to happen to the training. But uh, then we began to track trainees, meaning just like we do milestones here in the States, we do milestones for about 100 different trainees overseas, from faculty to residents. And so we want to touch them over and over. Every time we go, we want to find this person and march them along. And here's Dr. Kush Aaron from India, one of our partners. And you can see as we sequentially graded them from one to five, just like our milestones. But the milestones are written specifically for reconstructive surgery. You can see that upper extremity burns, he's up to a four. So we'll actually reimburse him for those cases. But I need to send Dr. Sen to help him work with muscle free flaps, because he's only a one at that level. He can only assist at that level. So we try to move people along and get them fully trained. And we need to, step six, build up other specialties because just doing our surgery won't work. And then at the end, we need to fund the surgeons. This is Dr. Rai again. I talked to you about, you, about him at the beginning to you. And uh, he was the general surgeon in Nepal who started off. But here he is now. He has a 50-person reconstructive plastic surgery team, nine of the country's 16 reconstructive surgeons. When the earthquake happened, they were the major trauma center for orthopedic problems. That's pretty cool. And that's, you take these, these incredible people, you give them a little, sub, little material, and you don't have to do the rest. So I have the opportunity of uh, welcoming uh, six women here today, and I want to introduce you to them. And when we began doing these training programs, we began noticing that we're seeing the first women reconstructive surgeons in the history of their country. Okay? In a place like Zimbabwe, there's one plastic surgeon, reconstructive surgeon, for every three to four million people. The numbers are staggering. Here, it's one out of every 50,000. But overseas, it's one out of a couple million. And so as we see these countries just begin plastic surgery, Dr. Ren's friend, Dr. Professor Muguti in Zimbabwe, came to visit us and several years ago says, I want to start the whole field of plastic surgery in my country of Zimbabwe. Okay? And usually there's only one or two people, and usually maybe one woman. So we're seeing the first generation. So we call them the pioneering women in reconstructive surgery. We've obtained funding from a high-end skin company called Skin SkinCeuticals. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's a very expensive skincare line. But they saw a, a great collaboration uh, with this, because they could uh, give money to these women 
and also it's great PR for them that they're that they're funding uh, pioneering women. And uh, as I told you about the incredible shortage of reconstructive surgeons, why not mobilize half the workforce, half the women out there? You can see. 50% of the women, of uh, population are women, but uh, in surgeons, in all surgery, less than 10% are women. I would say less than 1% of reconstructive surgeons are women. And so we want to do that. And so we have these six incredible women. I'm going to mention them a little bit and I'll ask them. They're all here today. Um, we've sponsored them to go to our annual meeting last week and to come to Stanford for a week of skills training, didactics, as well as leadership training. And I'll tell you about that. Uh, first is uh, Dr. Faith Muchemwa from uh, Harare, Zimbabwe, who just passed her plastic surgery, passed her plastic surgery boards, and is really the only woman uh, fully trained plastic surgeon in Zimbabwe. She's one of our partners. Dr. Farzana Ibrahim is a is a, um, a mentee of Dr. Shafka Kundakar from uh, Bangladesh. Uh, she has a big practice in a lot of diabetic wounds and general reconstruction. Uh, in places like Bangladesh, you don't, you're not a hand surgeon, you're not a cranial physician, you're an everything reconstructive surgeon. Dr. Selma Usufu uh, from Maputo, Mozambique, who runs an incredible busy burn center and all of reconstructive surgery. Dr. Shilo Shretha from Kathmandu, she's an orthopedic hand surgeon who's partnered with our plastics hand surgeons to start the first hand fellowship in the entire history of Nepal. Uh, Dr. Lorena Escudero from Guayaquil, Ecuador, a mentee of uh, Dr. Jorge Palacios, um, who put the, replanted the first hand in the history of the country. Um, but like, like that case I showed you, she was the first one to do it in the history of the country. And Dr. Pramila Shakya, also from uh, Kathmandu, Nepal, who is a phenomenal cleft surgeon and craniofacial surgeon. And so I'd like all these, these six women to please stand, just face the audience, and we'll give you a round of applause. Please stand and turn around. Please stand and turn around. Yeah. So, you know, it's been a remarkable opportunity to get to know them personally, see how they have to struggle to get supplies and resources in their home country and, and you know, what their kind of, their motives are for doing this great work. Um, they uh, are here for two weeks, um, funded by SkinCeuticals, and so we are giving them some specialty training in reconstructive surgery. We send teams to their home institutions over the course of the year to visit with them and to help them do cases. We fund their cases. Um, they're having great mentorship by senior uh, female surgeons. Dr. Curtin spent uh, a week in Ecuador with Dr. Escudero uh, talking about stuff and we kind of, I put out my entire Rolodex of our female reconstructive surgeons uh, to have them interact with uh, these six uh, phenomenal pioneers. And you know, they're not just pioneers, I think they're saints because they really have to have to struggle and fight through a lot of stuff that maybe our women faculty have to do now or two generations before as being the original one. So a lot of the things that they're going through now, I, can sure, I, can, I know that Dr. Jeffrey and Dr. Wren can attest that they've gone through before. And so that's why we added um, a leadership and management training as a result. And on, so today we're doing some dissections and microsurgery. Tomorrow uh, we're doing some more lectures. But on Thursday, we've cleared the slate off for these issues. And you can see I've brought in all of my uh, venture capital and consulting friends from the Bay Area to, to work with this. Some are board members for research. So you can see how to write papers, how to do a simple spreadsheet, how to run effective meetings. These women are trying to go into their hospital and completely male-dominated board and try to get resources. What? Extra day of operating room time, another nurse. All those things that we have to kind of gain consensus for and we're trying to give them the skills to be able to do that. Uh, conflict resolution by Sherry Wren. Uh, um, how to make a pitch, how to gain consensus by Wendy Hutton, who's a senior partner at Canaan. Uh, so these are really significant people who I think will add a lot to them. And they're also presenting, if you're interested in meeting them, you won't have time here in our department, but if you're interested in meeting them, uh, please come to Plastic Surgery Grand Rounds tonight because uh, they'll be presenting their cases from their home country. Next, I'll talk very briefly about the Laub Fellowship. I remember Don Laub was a person who trained uh, reconstructive uh, surgeons um, and started Interplast. Well, we wanted to honor him and also raise a bit of money. So from our alumni, they gave over $600,000 to start the Laub Fellowship. And many of you recognize Gloria Sue on the uh, far right there, one of our PGY4 residents who uh, spent the year doing the Laub Fellowship. 
she basically had a backpack and traveled the world, went to Vietnam three times, ate pho for breakfast every day uh, to track down the cases of cleft lip and palate that we did years ago to try to get outcomes data from that. And uh, she went to Bhutan, Nepal, all these other places. Uh, she wrote about our um, training program. Uh, she talked about surgical capacity building, which is really the, the, at the forefront of what we can do for the future. And she also made cases better. So she noticed that if we had complications from clip, lip and palate, many, many of the things that are perioperative issues that we don't deal with overseas, that we need to deal with overseas. Treat the patient overseas the same way you would treat the patient here. And so that, in, that entails translating patient education stuff into the home, home language. Surprise, surprise, sounds like a, a very novel, it doesn't sound like a very novel idea, but something that hasn't been done because you're so rushed to fly in and operate and fly out that you really have to do all the things that's necessary. Now I'll end with our, our uh, this year's lab fellow, Peter Deptula, who many of you general surgery residents also know. And so Peter's spending this year, uh, as you know, Peter's very big on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. So who better to help me take the teaching to the next phase? And so um, the next stage is how do we expand this teaching digitally? Survey has always has to be tactile. It's an apprentice model. We need Charlie Thorne to go to Vietnam to carve an ear. We need people to, to go and visit. But in the interim times, we need to have crosstalk and we need to have a lot of education that can be really blown out and sent out to a lot of people. So how do we expand digitally? We've uh, engaged with really the, the C-suite at uh, Facebook. Um, they're very interested. They need a little good press uh, these days. And um, uh, one of their senior vice presidents, uh, Hema uh, Buddharaju, is very interested in helping us and really developing a secret community. You're really cool if you have a, you're in a closed community, but if you're really, really cool, Peter may invite you to be in our secret community. <laughs> and uh, this will allow real-time interactions between our faculty and our trainees, uh, even live video, scheduled video, and follow, really the follow-up discussion. And in order to do that for us, we need to figure out who has Facebook, okay? So our surgeon faculty, these famous people around the country, my generation, uh, only about half of them have Facebook, whereas all of our outreach partners and trainees have smartphones and Facebooks. And that's really the, the evolution of what's available out there. Who can use Facebook? Uh, uh, who has, see, I'm in that period where I have Facebook, but I don't know how to use it, and I'm afraid to use it. So I'm in that little gap here. But only about 45% of people, surgeon faculty, know how to use it, whereas all of our outreach partners and trainees really know how to use it. And what they find valuable, if you look at the lightly shaded bars, Sure, our, tra our trainees around the world like to use it for personal use, but they're also using it for continuing medical education, which is something our faculty can't even wrap their minds around. They, they, they don't see that. And so we're trying to look at this difference and trying to you know, go to the end user. You know, we need to go to what our trainees are going to use, not what we want to give them. And so in terms of li live video lectures, someone in Bangladesh wants to sit uh, sit in their restaurant or sit at home and on Facebook watch a 15, 20 minute video on burn reconstruction. That's a lot easier than dialing into a modem, setting up and finding something online. But if it's on their Facebook, they can find it. And so almost all of our trainees would be interested, but not all of our faculty. That's okay, because we only need a couple of faculty to pump out those videos. And I told you I already have 100 videos to pump out. And so what we have here is what Peter has set up already, uh, really um, a secret community where there's a lot of rules to make it HIPAA compliant. Peter is the moderator on that. We also have a staff person, a research moderator, because sometimes there's an inappropriate co uh, comment or an inappropriate picture with patient ID. We can pull it off instantly, and that's as best as we can do in a HIPAA compliant way. They have people who want to sign up for this, have to go through various steps to acknowledge that they can't send identifiable pictures, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a secret community. It's not out there. No one will find it even. And you can see the types of things we can do. We can post five-minute videos, and this is on uh, how to do a thumb reconstruction, and we can actually track who has seen that video uh, over time. So we can, I can say to my trainees around the world now, all of a sudden, I, ha I can touch them and know where they are and see who's done what and follow them along just as if they were here at Stanford. And I can say, well, we're not going to reimburse you for those types of cases because you haven't done these three modules and kind of kept up with continuing medical education. And what's really cool is we can look at very complicated cases. This is a complex case anywhere in the world, even here. And as we're practicing it, we are trying to see in how we can 
start a discussion on this and how someone can post an article that's helpful and how we can make this. So imagine if you're in Zambia and you have a case like this, if you post it on your Facebook, and probably in a few hours you're gonna get lots of responses and, and, and do this. This really came to light a few years ago when we did this by, by email. It wasn't as efficient as this will be, but a guy in Zambia, our, our only partner in Zambia, flies in a bush plane around to take care of cases, had a case just like this with half the skull is missing. And then by email, it took about three or four days for people to respond in an email thread. And then one person rightly suggested, well, why don't you dress and put in a tissue expander so you can stretch out the skin and then move the extra scalp skin over. The guy in Zambia, who's a very seasoned plastic surgeon, said, yeah, right, great idea, but there's no way I can ever get a, a, a tissue expander in Zambia. Well, that caught the attention of a private practice plastic surgeon in St. Louis, and two days later, he fed one, an extra one from his office right to this guy. So imagine doing this in real time rather than having it stretched out in four or five days. So for, in terms of digital education, we have amazing faculty and content. I've emptied my Rolodex around the country. Um, we should leverage this. The cost can be kept low with digital education, uh, just Peter's salary for the year. Uh, this may scale up our education efforts. However, just like I said before, we're tailors. We can't really replace hands-on training. That's why those quarterly visiting educator trips are critical. And the future of success, we don't know yet. It depends if people really want to interact in this way. So in closing, final thoughts on capacity building in global reconstructive surgery. There's a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. You hear about all these organizations, people always ask me, what do you think about Ofsmile? What do you think about this? I don't care. I mean, there's, there's so much work to do that we should share the work and share the credit. So I'm happy collaborating with any organization. Uh, developing sustained training and taking these six pioneers and seeing what their residents and students do over time and watching it multiply um, is essential. We need the best faculty to train. So Sherry and I always talk about how can we get general surgery involved and kind of open this up to other things. And we're happy to explore that. And hopefully this digital education can expand the impact of training. So thank you very much.